Hey there, everybody. It's a new week and it's a new time to be in the word together at home on YouTube on Facebook. Good afternoon, Pastor Howard. Good afternoon. Yeah, this kind of a contest, we're going to uh, put all three times morning, afternoon or evening. This is almost <laughs> evening. And, and uh, have you vote on this uh, as to which we are brightest in and which comes across the best. So this, by itself, yeah. that's exciting quite apart from from these lessons which are <laughs> exciting themselves. <laughs> I'm calling this Reformation Week because yeah. we celebrated Reformation on Sunday, but it doesn't actually land until Saturday. Uh, on Friday, we have plans for a watch party to, uh, to get together at 6 o'clock p.m. Mountain Time on Zoom. If you want the link to that, and uh, well, just uh, send us an email and we can get you connected to that because it's uh, one of those deals where we're not going to put the link on our website, but we want you to be involved and included in the group. So you can hear Pastor Patton and I talk about Reformation. And then at 6.30, we're going to end the Zoom and we're going to watch a movie, uh, everyone, wherever you're at from home. And we'll send out some details uh, about that real soon. Look forward to it. Yeah, look forward. Big weekend. Big, And you can do all this on Zoom and modern technology. It's almost like being in Wittenberg. <laughs> That's right. Cutting edge, cutting edge, getting the word of God out to wherever you're at, whatever language. Well, well, we'll speak English in our Bible study today. And the prayer as well. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your gospel message. Lord, bless us as we uh, consider your eternal gifts today, as we uh, consider the, the scripture for All Saints Day. Lord, bless us with your Holy Spirit as we learn, as we grow in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, just a couple words of introduction, perhaps, to All Saints Day, because it's got a it's got a blessed history, needless to say. Um, but uh, near as we can tell, All Saints Day goes all the way back to about the year 350, right around the time that the Nicene Creed uh, came in together, you know, and that was between Nicaea and, uh, uh, and Constantinople from 325 to 381. And I know you wanted to know this, but this is, uh, uh, All Saints Day goes back to roughly about the year 340. Uh, only it wasn't All Saints Day at that time, it was All Martyrs Day. And you know from some of the persecutions of the church through that, especially year, through the year 300 AD, uh, the persecutions took a terrible, terrible toll on the lives uh, of, of early Christians. It was called All Martyrs Day, and it was remembered simply as the time and all the places where the martyrs met their their immediate face-to-face -face with our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, over the years, it changed dates, changed times, uh, and finally settled on about November 1st because there were other, um, uh, other uh, uh, special days that kind of conflicted with this, but this worked well. And one of the reasons it worked well, Pastor Stephen, was the fact that this was the time when um, <clears throat> the... Uh, cemeteries would have rising from the tombs uh, this mist and it was because of what was happening between the warm earth and the cold air <clears throat> and this was also a time for a lot of superstition and a lot of apparitions and so whether and how exactly all Saints Day and this uh, <clears throat> these kind of apparitions arising from the cemeteries and Northern Europe, <clears throat> how they came together is not altogether sure, but what we do know for sure is that the date was set November 1st, when all the saints would be remembered, and the evening before <clears throat> was called Hallowed Evening, or as we've come to know it in the English, Halloween, uh, and it was at this time, November or actually October 31st, the eve of All Saints Day, that Luther put the 95 Theses, which was the introduction to the Reformation at that point, put up these 95 Theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church, which we'll find more about more this weekend. <clears throat> um, and as the people came to church, that simply started it. 
uh, the the 95 theses, uh, which took extraordinary issue with the sale of forgiveness or indulgence as it was called um, uh, that really precipitated got the whole reformation according to god's holy spirit and according to his grace and guidance <clears throat> on the map so november 1st has a special uh, time for us as lutheran christians we have celebrated it for again 500 years, uh, but also for the whole church. Um, and these three lessons that have been chosen and are used throughout Christendom today, um, uh, nations, languages, cultures, denominations, all of us come together to celebrate on November 1st, uh, this uh, day of the remembrance of the saints of all kinds. And of course, we sing that Sunday after Sunday, therefore with angels and archangels and the whole company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name. And that's actually where we start, lauding God's uh, name in the book of Revelation, the first of the three lessons uh, that we're going to read this coming Sunday, November 1st, for All Saints Day, Revelation chapter 7. <clears throat> and there we are. There's the throne. That's a great, great little icon up there in the corner, Pastor Stephen. Yeah. Here we are, first reading for All Saints Day. Now, if it were up to me, I would have done this differently as, as the church decided what they would uh, choose for All Saints Day. They did an extraordinary job in choosing nine <clears throat> through pretty much the end of chapter seven. But for reasons I'm not altogether sure of, uh, the church decided that we would also read 12,000 of the tribe of Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher. <laughs> So I'm not sure why we're doing, but don't go to sleep with that because there are some really good things introducing it and some good things following it and a quick word about why it's in there. Verse two, Revelation chapter seven, and you know about the book of Revelation. Uh, in fact, at the very beginning of uh, this book, chapter one, there is a kind of All Saints introduction already in the third verse. That's going to read it. You can just go ahead and read the first verses and you'll figure out why this works so well for All Saints Day. Verse two. Then I saw another angel descending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea. Now, this is part of, uh, how would you say it? Um, uh, uh, early Christian, not just Christian, but, but early uh, geography. The idea was that there were four creatures. This is not uniquely Christian, but there were four creatures who governed the four corners of the earth. And that's the way it was viewed at that point. Uh, the geography of a flat earth, and there were four angels, northeast, southwest, and they were the ones who took care of um, the universe, more or less. So this uh, is is part of that. How would you say it? It would be it would be a kind of early Christian worldview. Uh, at any rate, that's where the four angels come from, and they were at, of course, at the command of God. And he called with a loud voice to the four angels, John writes, who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God. And where? On their foreheads. We're going to come back to that as we finish this up, because there is in Revelation chapter one, a remarkable and I think a kind of beautiful remembrance of this passage. And it has to do with our foreheads. And obviously, as it has to do with our foreheads, uh, yours truly, and I suspect Pastor Stephen as well, immediately we're thinking baptism. At any rate, <laughs> there we have been sealed by God on our foreheads. Verse four, and I heard the number of the sealed 
144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. I'll just read through. These are the 12 sons of Jacob, all right? Uh, and each of them has their place, and each of them has an allotted number. 12,000 Judah, 12,000 Reuben, 12,000 Gad, 12,000 Asher, and this is in the order of their birth. 12,000 from Naphtali, 12,000 from Manasseh. Uh, Manasseh has his own identity because he is not the son of Jacob. He is a grandson of Jacob or Israel. 12,000 from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 from the tribe of Levi. 12,000 from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun, and 12,000 from the tribe of Judah, and 12,000 from the tribe of Benjamin. So the only real, I think, how would you say it, the only real communication that comes to us and for us today is that if you happen to be a member of or part of the Jehovah's Witnesses, a sect or cult, uh, you're going to find out that they believe there are only 144,000 that are going to make it into the pearly gates. And so if you want to uh, become one of these, you would do well to um, get a hold of one of these 144,000 uh, via the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. Anyway, that is something very special for them, and this is where they get it. And it is uh, at this point, little more than interesting, the 12,000 uh, number being highly symbolic and not a uh, number that you memorize or such or a final uh, final number. Anyway, that's, that's the promise. I heard the number of those who were sealed on their foreheads from every tribe of the sons of Israel. So we're going to make sure that we've got the Israelites in eternity, all right? Verse 9. And then John, the one who writes the book of Revelation along with his gospel of John, after this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and all people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Got to stop there just a second. Because this is, how would, how, the best way to say it would be, this is the fulfillment of the mission of God in history. Whether it starts out with Abraham and the promise that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him and through his lineage, through his people. Um, and uh, then God's mission through Israel, that they are to be his missionary people in every corner of the universe, uh, and uh, they are to be the ones who are to touch every nation with the words of God's blessing, right? Well, they did a very poor job of this because they kind of hoarded God's blessings, which seems to be the case with most of God's people. We tend to take his blessings and turn them in on ourselves. And so often the mission of God gets second best if it is even noticed at all. Well, here we've got these words. And after this, verse 9, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, all tribes, all peoples, and all languages, God's eternal grace and gifts to this planet, to these people, is all there. Not simply that 144,000, as you saw in the previous verses, but now the, the eternity is, is filled with all of God's people, races, tribes, colors, all of it is there standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Two quick thoughts. There's so much here that I am uh, have difficulty filling it all in, but, but hang on. <laughs> There's two things at least that need to be said right here, and that is number one, the lamb. Go all the way back to God's, if you will, 
original sacrifice. Go all the way back to Genesis chapter 22, all the way back to where God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, and sacrifice him. The lamb was one of the methods of sacrifice, not simply for Abraham, but for the nations around him, uh, nations many of which practiced human sacrifice. But here is the one who is identified as the lamb. And all the way back in Genesis chapter 22, the voice of God comes to Isaac as he is about to sacrifice his son in this, uh, in, in this, in this strange, strange uh, world. Um, and, and just as he is about to sacrifice his son in ways that nobody can understand, except for the God who calls out, Abraham, stop, Abraham, I will provide the sacrifice. And this is the end of human sacrifice as it's given to Abraham as part of his fundamental mission to the world. And also it is the presence and the introduction of the lamb who will be given for the sake of the world. 2000 BC, right? 2000 BC, 2000 years before our Lord. Uh, but at that is what the lamb is. And now here is the lamb in eternity as the one who is the very presence of God's love, the very power of God's grace. And the lamb is next to the right hand of God, as we say in, uh, in our creeds, who sits at the right hand of God. Okay, now verse 10. No, I'm no one, two more, two more clothed in white robes, okay, that is self-presentic, or they can understand that, but with palm branches in their hands. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, we're all the way back from eternity and from this moment in timelessness and in God's heaven. We are transported back just in this instant to our Lord Jesus Christ, entry into Jerusalem, right? There's the palm branches. Now, if you would read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you would simply say, read that they took branches from the trees. But John, John says, no, they were not simply branches from the trees. They were palm branches. And that is the remembrance and the celebration that is happening right now in eternity, that grandest of all Palm Sunday entrances, right? Verse 10, and they're crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped, saying, hang on to these words, right? Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever read those words, thought about those words, and it's taken years for me to all of a sudden remember I was singing these words probably from the time that I was about two or three years old. In the old page five from our hymnal, 1941 hymnal, uh, through the 1982 hymnal, and through um, communion service chapter three today as we have in our hymnal and there we sing as we sing gloria in excelsis glory to god in the highest and on earth peace goodwill toward men and then we sing we praise thee we bless thee we worship thee we glorify thee we give thanks to thee and at this moment especially we join with on All Saints Day, or any time we do the glory in next year, we sing with the angels in heaven. And I used to say, people would say, well, do Lutherans speak in tongues? And I said, well, occasionally we do. Um, we do, <laughs> when we sing the glory in excelsis, we are so over 
well with gratitude, with thanksgiving, with blessing, that words fail us. And so we end up singing these same words again and again. Therefore, we praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee, because there are no words sufficient to say thank you the way we would like. But we're right up there with the elders, the four living creatures, and all those in their white robes saying, verse 12 again, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever. Amen. That's a lot. <laughs> Anything else right there, Pastor Steve, before we go on into what I think is really the meat of, of, uh, of this revelation section for, for uh, All Saints Day? All right. I'm sorry about that. I was muted there. There's so many uh, different settings of that of these words that we sing uh, in our different services on Sundays, and uh, and really the hope is that everybody that's gathered for worship will know that when we're joined in Christ in communion, that we are are as close as we've ever been to those who are with the Lord in heaven. That's and right. so in Jesus, we have that closeness that we long for. And, uh, and there's just this glimpse in Revelation of the praise that's taken place that was in this vision to John. And so to know that, wow, there's praise of Jesus in heaven, just as there's praise of Jesus right now in our worship services. And so um, there's a, a doing things together, sharing experiences that we, we treasure those when we think of our loved ones and our life together. And when someone dies, part of the loss that we feel is those things that we do together, those common uh, experiences. And so this is a moment in our worship where we know that Jesus is really present in this meal, in this sacrament, and our loved ones are with Jesus. And we are here with Jesus, and we can treasure that as a, a new shared experience. I, I hope that people look forward to that, not only this Sunday, but every time we gather. Yeah, yeah, and and we do get tongue tied, it, it, and and that I, I think is a growing, growing, growing thing. I know it is with me, and that is the need to say thank you. You know, the very first. The very first um, uh, aspect, the very first of our relationship with God is first and foremost, trust. I trust. That's where it begins. Nothing else gets. But right after we learn to trust, we learn to worship. And so trust is immediately followed by thanksgiving as it is here. So as God has called us in his love and we trust his love and his presence and his grace and his goodness, suddenly we just got to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you <laughs> in whatever words. And we see that even in the eternity, Pastor Stephen, there's a little bit of tongue-tiedness as we say, oh, I'm and blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor because the love is so overwhelming. Verse 13. Mm -hmm. Then one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these clothed in white robes and where have they come from? And John in his vision said, I said, verse 14, I said to him, this, that is this elder, sir, you know, and so he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. And what that great tribulation is has defied scholars' final definition as long as there has been a church, whether it is the tribulation of those first centuries that we'd mentioned earlier as we introduced uh, All Saints Day, that first particularly 300 years of that time of tribulation, or what we know today is that there are probably more, more there is more persecution in the 19th and 20th centuries of Christians around the world than there has been since the creation of the world, because um, uh, the, the, the persecutions of God's people really never stop. What that tribulation is, whether it is early church, whether it is the persecutions of today, or whether it is that whole period of tribulation, which is what I believe, 
that we are those who come out of the Great Tribulation. And that is part of our experience today, not persecution in the sense of being um, tracked down, hunted down, thrown in prison or worse uh, by non-believers, by the pagans, by persons of other, but but something as, as profound as COVID-19. This is for us a kind of, again, a kind of time of tribulation. And I think, I think that that word tribulation covers the whole gamut of human experiences. Pastor Stephen, thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Well, as far as Christian tribulation, whether it's persecution or all the other ways that we face uh, uh, hardship and, and pain in this world, uh, I've heard it said that there are more Christians on the planet now than in the entire history of Christianity, mainly because there's more people alive on the planet right now. <laughs> and so um, there's so many more. And that's, that's fascinating to think about just, you know, all the tribes and nations, all the tongues, all the people that will be before the Lamb, uh, with all their breadth of, of experience, Think about all the hardships that are existing in places farther away from us, um, but we'll all be gathered together, and um, we we have a lot to look forward to together. Well, there are these these uh, last words, Dan, and we'll just give them not what they deserve, but such as we have time for as we prepare for this lesson to be read this Sunday. Um, um, they have, let's go back to 14 again. He said, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more neither thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. Here we are with the lamb. And isn't that a kind of interesting, delicious contradiction or conflation? I'm not sure what the appropriate word, that the lamb is the shepherd. Right, and this yeah. is the way, oh Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so, our Savior is Lamb, He is Shepherd, He is Redeemer, He is Lord. And the last words of this reading, and He will guide them to springs of living water again straight out of the book of John, as Jesus talks to the woman at the well, and she asks him for some of this water, and he says, I will give you water that will quench your soul. It will be living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. We don't have time for this again, but I found as I was preparing for this, Pastor Stephen, there are five times in the book of Isaiah that God speaks about drying the tears of his people. Uh, and that's the way, in a sense, the old te or the, the, uh, the last book of the Bible, Revelation speak, it speaks once again about the tears. Um, and it says, <laughs> yeah, um, um, verse 4 of chapter 21, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has ended. It has passed away. And then these last words, remember about the forehead? Yeah. It was marked by the angel on the forehead. Let me read the last chapter of the book of Revelation. And you can look this up at home and read the whole last chapter. Chapter 22. And this is verse 1 of chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Then, now verse 3 of chapter 22, the throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, 
and his servants will serve him. Ready? They will see his face. Hear it? They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And this is, uh, again, so simple and so beautiful, and yet so far beyond our, uh, our, our human experience, except that his name will be on their foreheads. And I think of this and praise God for it each time you and I say it in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. His name, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, is on your foreheads as it is on your heart. So much more, but that's all we got time for. <laughs> we didn't even have time for this so far today. But, um, yeah. Epistle? This Epistle reading. This is simpler. Um, first John. Remember, John wrote three epistles, three letters, um, and they uh, come in the New Testament right after uh, St. Peter's two letters. And this is one of the very shortest of epistle readings all year, but it still is so full and so rich and so blessing, so blessing. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called, think of, hear it, children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. But, beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we do know this, that when he appears, we shall be like him, who is the son of God, the child of God. And we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. As we think about, and the question comes up, I think in our minds often, and it often comes up in Bible studies of one sort or another, what will we be like in eternity? Will we have bodies? And Well, we go back to 1 Corinthians 15, and uh, St. Paul gives us a word that we were, we were mortal, we will be immortal, we were perishable, we will be imperishable, we had a, a physical body, now we will have a spiritual body. Uh, but what, what will we look like? What, well, this is the way St. John sees it and says it. We know, <coughs> excuse me, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And that's enough to look forward to for day upon day and year upon year. Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Have you ever seen Jesus? No, but I do have a precious spiritual imagination. When he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And as we say, that's good enough for me. Amen. I love the, the children of God. You know, we, we think of those who have died in the faith and as being with God. Uh, what a joy to know that God has them as his children. And we are his children now, but uh, very much close to their heavenly father. And during the service on Sunday, just to pop down a little bit, yeah, yeah. As we remember the, the names of those Zion members and loved ones who uh, have died in the last 12 months, we'll light a candle and, and we'll, as the candles are being lit, we'll be singing, let's see, is it, yeah, you can see this on this, your screen. We'll be singing Children of the Heavenly Father as we light our candles. And I encourage you at home, if you're watching on the live stream, unable to come to the building, things are pretty, pretty rough COVID wise in El Paso. So most of you will be at home. Um, light a candle you know, in the next couple of days. Thank you. We'll get it ready for Sunday. And uh, we'll be singing Children of the Heavenly Father. And then we'll have a time of prayer. We'll speak the names of those who've uh, gone to glory in the last 12 months. Or ring a church bell. And then after the final name, 
it'll be a chance for everybody to additionally speak the names of, of additional people who are on your hearts and minds. And then we'll extinguish our, our candles as we sing these final two verses. And I just love this, uh, a miracle to each time it happens as the door to heaven opens and the father beams, beloved, heir of gifts a king would covet. Far more tender than a mother, far more caring than a father, God, into your arms we place them. With your love and peace, embrace them. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that on Sunday. Those are different numbers in the hymnal. Are they the same tune? Okay, so um, Children of the Heavenly Father, this is the hymn and the verses that correspond with that, but it's the same tune. See this wonder in the making. Okay, yeah. And which is a... Yeah, so even though the the tune is not there for the second, oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so it's two different hymns, but the tune will be the same. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Look forward to it. Look forward yeah. to it. And okay. the final one. Our some, gospel. Some of the most familiar words of our Lord Jesus in all of our 2,000 years of history, listening to his words and learning from his words. And these are the Beatitudes. And for all of the, for all of the, the numbers of times we read them and hear them and love them and recognize that in the Gospel of St. Luke, this is really the introduction to our Lord's public teaching. Uh, for all of that, I'm still thinking that we've got a lot to learn about these words. I've been studying them now, I was telling Pastor Stephen earlier, um, since my last year at the seminary, which was in 1961, and I'm not sure yet to this day, uh, going on 2001, <laughs> that, I, that I have, have, have uh, plumbed the depth or have wrapped myself in the promises but I'd like to do it for a little, just a little while. Um, um, uh, um, I'm going to read just that first, that, that first um, um, verse, uh, the introduction, and then that first verse, blessed are the poor in spirit. And then we're going to take a little excursion because I think it's worth the trip. Um, and then we'll come back to, to the Beatitudes once again. But seeing the crowds... Jesus went up on the mountain. Now, um, the mountain probably for us, if we think of the mountains, Franklin Mountains, this would be a, a little bit less than a mountain, but it certainly is a promontory, a high hill once again, where people can gather all around, uh, probably in a great circle, um, while Jesus is teaching them from the top of this, of this hill, or as it's called, a mountain. And if it's not a mountain in terms of his physical presence, it is without question one of the great mountains of all humanities because of what Jesus teaches us from this promontory or this hill. Ready? Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, whether them is specifically the disciples, I think that it is loud enough and the people are gathered close enough, no need for social distancing at that moment, that they could hear the words or maybe catch them also, the words from their neighbors. What did he say? What did he say? And this is what he says, beginning, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay, now, Pastor Stephen, while I'm just talking, can you go all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 7? Because I'd like to just take a couple verses out of there, maybe to make this word kingdom of heaven just a little bit more uh, understandable, close, um, uh, and, and what the people understood as Jesus says to them, Blessed, blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, um, for thine, or for, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And I want to do two things. What does Jesus mean when he says blessed? 
the Greek word means, makarios, means particularly happy, blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. We could well translate that, blessed are the spiritual beggars. Okay, I'm going to come back to that. But blessed are the spiritual beggars, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's just take a couple minutes now, Pastor Stephen, and go back to 2 Samuel. And let me set just a little bit of the background. 2 Samuel chapter 7. What we're going toward is when Jesus says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, what is he trying to communicate? Or what does he actually say? And what are people trying to understand? The background for this is that David has finally conquered the land all around him. He has uh, become, uh, how would you say, a very, very important leader in a very now important nation. Israel was at that point as large as it has ever been. And David and consolidating all the tribes and all the little nations and all the different languages has put together a significant gathering of geography so that that kingdom of David or that kingdom uh, of heaven or that kingdom of God is a rather substantial kingdom. <coughs> Excuse me again. Um, and, and this is, again, chapter 7, I want to go down to uh, verse 4. David now is saying, this is not right. I'm living in a palace while, while our, our heavenly father sits in a tent, the tabernacle. And he is saying, how can I properly thank God? How? Um, how, 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 this is not right and so I want to make it right verse 4 Nathan who is one of the great prophets of that time and David's almost personal prophet that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan go and tell my servant David thus says the Lord would you build me a house to dwell in I've not lived in a house since the day I was brought up um or since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, they had that tent, that tabernacle. I have been moving about in a tent from my dwelling in all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel. Did I ever speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, let's stop there and go all the way down to uh, let's see, it's verse 11, verse 11. Um, and, and there God begins to make one of the great promises um, um, that he's ever made to any person or any groups of persons, or in this case, God's people Israel, and more immediately, God's people the church. Verse 11. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, God says, I will give you rest from all of your enemies. David has been a warrior, a warrior king, and now finally he is at rest. His enemies have been conquered, and he can look with a certain kind of, a, I guess, peace and satisfaction out of the nation that God has cobbled together for him and that he is now king verse 12 when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers i will raise up your offspring after you hear that david is going to die and god promises i will raise up your descendants your offspring after you who shall come from your body and i will establish his kingdom Verse 13, kingdom is the word, right? Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Verse 13, David, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. 
God is promising to David that he is going to have a son and his sons will have sons, etc., etc. Right here, verse 14, I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. We're talking about a specific historical person, Solomon, the son of David and the one who becomes king after him. Okay, when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. Verse 15, but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. You remember Saul was the king who trashed his kingdom and trashed his kingship and ended up suffering and dying for it. Verse 16, verse 16, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Here the words are once again. Okay. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This was spoken in roughly the year 1000 BC, 1000 years before our Lord was born, 1000 years before these words were spoken on the mountain or the hill in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, just take these words, put them in the back of your head, but remember them. Verse 16. Because the people to whom Jesus is speaking remember these words, and they are as clear and as sure and as filled with promise and hope as you can. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. This promise and these words have now been kept as far as the people gathered around Jesus in this time of the Beatitudes, this time of the Sermon on the Mount. And when Jesus says to them, blessed are the poor in spirit, or blessed are the spiritual beggars, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And there is at that point a rush in that crowd as people turn to each other and speak to each other and remember to each other what this might mean. That the kingdom, there it is. Blessed are the spiritual beggars. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That introduces this, if you will, Sermon on the Mount, as we call it. Blessed are those of you who are spiritual beggars, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Hang on to that for just a second, because all the way back from King David to this moment on the mountain or this moment on the hill, history is coming to a kind of new normal, <laughs> maybe it might be, is the way that, that suddenly everything is changing. Now, as I went through these Beatitudes again, let me just read this through real quickly. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We'll stop there just a second. I, I said that, that I did some work way, 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 way back when, 60 years ago almost, my goodness, when I was finishing up my master's degree at the seminary in St. Louis. And I, I used a, uh, a uh, um, commentary written by Dr. Martin Luther. And it was beautiful because that, he's just a gifted guy. At the same time, he said, this is, this is law. This is God's command or his demand. This is the expectation of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are mourned. Blessed are those who are meek. Blessed, et cetera, et cetera. Except that you don't, you, you don't start law with blessed. 
and and this is not as as some have thought of this is ethics this is the christian ethic this is what you what you do if you're a christian or this is christian morality i think it's much deeper than this and this is at least as we close this time and this lesson today and we think about the beatitudes i think it's deeper than simply morals or ethics or law or gospel there is something it seems to me far deeper and you can think it through and uh, either straighten me out or say yeah you're getting close but i i i believe what our savior is saying at this point is against a background of human experience and one of the ways that i think of ways of summarizing the human experience uh, is in a song written by or not i don't know if she wrote it or not uh, but in a song that is was sung back in 1969 i can remember it do you remember the song or have you ever heard it since if you're not that old a song by patty page and it was is that all there is and the song had a she was a great singer a great popular singer but the song is a kind of desperation she remembers that she was picked up in the middle of the night and her dad went running out of the house because their house was on fire and the home that she had she looked up and she watched with her parents as their home was devoured by flames and the verse goes is that all there is is that all there is that your home and your livelihood and your security is finally fire is that all there is and then she goes, she's taken by her dad to a circus, and they sat there all afternoon and uh, looked at the circus, and when it was over, she was no longer entertained. And she said, is that all there is? Is that all there is? And then she talks about a little bit older when she falls in love for the first time, madly in love, and her the boy of her dreams leaves, and she says, is that all there is that you lose all your loves? Is that all there is? And the choruses go through each of these moments when in a kind of quiet desperation and ends up as a song of deep sadness, I think, is that all there is? I think that this this humanity at this point in human history and at this point in human history that you and I presently live in can be summed up in so many ways by so many humans and so much of humanity. Is that all there is? Are we just like squirrels or rabbits that our lives manage or don't? Oh, there you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there you. Let's look at the very last verse. The, the very last verse. Um, there. Yeah, there it is. There it is. Uh, I know what you must be saying to ourselves. If if that's all there is, my friend, let I know what you must be saying to yourselves. If that's the way she feels about it, this is what she's saying. Why doesn't she just end it all? Oh no, not me. I'm not ready for that final disappointment. Is that all there is? Because I know just as well as I'm standing here talking to you, when that final moment comes and I'm breathing my last breath. I'll be saying to myself, is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, my friend, then let's keep dancing, which is the refrain, then let's keep dancing. Let's break out the booze and have a ball if that's all there is. I think it's over against that sort of quiet desperation over that deep disappointment at certain stages in our lives over against the fact that life has no meaning, life has going no place. It's simply a matter of trying to entertain yourself or live as comfortably or conveniently as you can, but finding out along the way, whether it's family or friends or work or funds or whatever it might be, saying, is that all there is? Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount saying, blessed are the spiritual beggars, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There is a kingdom of heaven, and blessed are those who are poor in spirit. 
And that very first line sets the theme for everything else that follows. If we get the first line, we may be close to the last one. Blessed are the spiritual beggars. It is the recognition, Jesus is saying, that we are more than simply mind or body or emotion. There is at the very center of who we are as human beings, somebody has described it as a kind of God-shaped blank, a center of what we might call at some point or other the spirit, there is a center and probably the way it can be best expressed is in Psalm 42, where at this point, probably David once again, where David begins to write, as the deer hounded by the wild animals longs for the cooling water brooks, which will slake his thirst and preserve him from death, as so longs my soul for you, O God. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so longs, that's much better than pants, <laughs> oh, so longs my soul for you, O God. And then these words, yeah, thank you, Stephen. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. And this is what Jesus is teaching right from the very first words of a sermon that he records. Listen, listen. It is either, is that all there is? Or, blessed are those who have a spiritual longing. A hunger and a thirst is sometimes the way the Old Testament Psalms speak about the soul as the soul hungers and thirsts and longs for something more, but there is nothing more. There is nothing more than circuses or empty loves or friends that are fail us or houses that burn. Jesus saying there is more, happy. Happy are you if you long in your spirit for God. And that itself can be said in so many ways, but that's where this is starting as we today think about All Saints Day. What were they longing for? What were they looking for? Why do we have an All Saints Day? Can we join in their longing? Can we join in their finding? Can we join? Can we be part of that spiritual fellowship? Can we sit on this kind of a hill or a mountain with our Savior and say, show me, show me, help me out in my life to find the love, the peace, the joy, the forgiveness, the grace, the new life. I want, I I long for this. And then Jesus goes on with those following words. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, because we do. We long for something always deeper and deeper. Blessed are those who mourn, for I shall comfort you. It is no accident that Jesus says again and again as he's leaving his disciples, I will send you the Holy Spirit. I will send you the whole spirit of truth. I will send you what? The comforter, the comforter, the Holy Spirit who will come and new and renew and make your life the next stage in your life. The tears will still be there. The morning will still be there, but you will know God's peace. You will know God's comfort. Blessed are the meek. There is probably a better word than simply the meek. Probably blessed are those who search. Blessed are those who don't think they know it all. Blessed are those who open up and keep their hearts and minds open for the more, for what they're longing for, and don't settle for just the cheap stuff of this world, if that is all there is. For the meek, the meek shall be given not simply a chunk of ground in geography, but they shall receive the earth, the earth, infinitely more. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. There's the words once again, who long for, like the deer who was longing for 
longing for the cooling water brooks, that there is in our life some driving spiritual forces. They are not met simply by what we hold or what we contain or what we earn or who we think we are or all the ways that we believe this constitutes real humanity. Humanity, Jesus says, no. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, which for a relationship with the eternal God. For a relationship with Jesus Christ in this case, for a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for a relationship with God. Jesus says that later in this Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and a relationship with him, not just ethics or morals or being good. It is a matter of being one and coming into a unity with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as he calls me, embraces me, and says, you are my son, my daughter. I will never let you go. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall know something of peace, of satisfaction. Blessed are the merciful. Now it's on us, isn't it? Isn't it? Just like the Ten Commandments, it moves from a relationship with God to a relationship with the persons around us. Blessed are those who give mercy to those who don't deserve it, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The purity in heart comes from only one place, and that is for the, from the forgiveness of the cross in our Lord Jesus Christ. For they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> Not always easy. It's a, maybe particularly at times like this in our nation as to what we are going through. And yet, yet, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called kids of God, the sons of God, the children of God, the daughters of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of their relationship with me, okay? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And now we'll leave 11 for another time. But we end up in a sense where we started. Blessed are the poor in spirit, verse three, for what? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that God creates for us in each and every generation, in each and every moment in our lives as we turn to him. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst and long for a deeper, a greater, a richer, relationship with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and that is the very last. Blessed are those who are persecuted for living in a relationship with me, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And even as that kingdom of God, that kingdom of heaven, or that kingdom of David, way back in 2 Samuel, is is. Uh, the presence not of simply uh, a, a, a place, but it is primarily a sense that we are living in two kingdoms. We're living in the kingdom of the world, if you will. We're living in this kingdom which is around us and in which we must thrive. Uh, and also the kingdom of heaven, which is always present and is proclaimed by his church, proclaimed by his church. And so that is, uh, again, the center of our proclamation, the center of, uh, of All Saints Day, the center of those who have gone before us, the center of those who we remember, whether it's a St. James or a St. John or a St. Peter, or whether our saint mother or father or grandfather or grandmother or close friend, blessed blessed are you for theirs is the kingdom of heaven so much more so much more but that's as much as i think we've got room for today so last thought is that all there is no blessed are the spiritual beggars stephen rejoice and be glad no matter who's elected, 
in the couple of days after our worship service on Sunday, there's the, the election and half of the country is gonna be anxious and sad <laughs> and the other half might be glad, uh, but uh, all of us need to rejoice and be glad because we belong to the kingdom of God. Our reward is great in heaven that's our memory verse, at least that little snippet, nothing else. Be glad for your reward is great in heaven. Whatever life is doing to you right now, think of the eternal perspective and rejoice. And our inheritance is infinitely more as beautiful and as much as we love it as the United States of America, <laughs> or our home, or our family, or our friends, or all the grace and gifts that God pours into our lives. Our kingdom is eternal, and our life in Christ is forever, and our kingdom never ends. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever yeah. and ever. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Blessings to you. And we're looking forward again to uh, our Reformation Fund on Friday. So uh, stay tuned to our website and we'll try to get information out every way we can. All the details of how to watch this film. <laughs> Thanks for the time with you. I, I enjoyed it and was blessed by it, Pastor Stephen. Me, me more. <laughs> All right. Take care, everybody. <laughs>